Our first panel of the day is Learn More About Way Out, a game that addresses sexual harassment and real world allyship and gain insight into how the game contribute, contributes to the lasting behavioral change. And I'm going to have our panel actually introduce themselves um, because they know who they are. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hi, guys. Um, my name is Alyssa Mercante. I'm a senior editor at Kotaku. Um, most of my reporting is based on like women identifying and queer identifying experiences in gaming. So I'm really excited to be here, and I'm really excited that I was asked to do this. And I'm joined here today by two people who I'm also going to let introduce themselves because they know themselves better than I. Hi. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Daniela Steinfeld. I come originally from Serbia. I'm based in uh, New York. And uh, I come from acting and documentary film, and now I find myself in a world of video games. I'm Nick Fortuno. I'm a game designer and game educator. I'm the co-founder of a game studio in New York called Fanatics, and I am the director of Gaming Pathways at City College of New York, which if you have been at this conference, you've heard someone from the mayor's office talk about probably every two hours. <laughs> So I'm really interested because, Daniela, you said that you found your way into gaming. This is new for you. Welcome to the community of gamers. How did you come up with this idea? Um, so I made a documentary about healing after sexual violence, um, which was prompted by my personal experience. I'm a, a survivor of rape. Uh, that's why I uh, came to the United States from Serbia. Um, and uh, healing from, from the trauma and having PTSD prompted me to make a feature documentary. Uh, and during making of the documentary, I was just thinking about the universal experience of um, all of us that, or most of us that seek help after surviving sexual violence, uh, found out that in one way seeking help is also dangerous. Uh, it might as well be more dangerous than other. And somehow, uh, uh, kind of um, speaking with survivors of rape, speaking also with perpetrators and child abusers that, that uh, spoke for my film, kind of rounding up the whole culture of uh, rape uh, or rape culture, um, I started to think about kind of uh, that we are alone in this. There's like no agenda. And it's, somehow reminded me of a hero's journey. And if you kind of like, kind of make a choice, uh, you don't know uh, how this choice is gonna kind of bang onto your head and kind of how, how will you lead with the consequences of choices that you make while trying to heal or seek justice. And so then I was just like, this looks like some kind of a, like, a, like a game, like a video game, like a hero's journey. And I was just blabbing about it a lot, actually, uh, without, playing games or knowing games, and suddenly I found myself uh, speaking with Susanna Pollock at South by Southwest, laughing about this, saying, oh, you're in games, well, I have an idea for a video game, and she was like, okay, let's take a Zoom call. It was like, holy, okay. Um, and um, when when I had just kind of a concept, uh, Susanna said, like, this 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 has um, great potential, you should develop it, and I'm going to kind of welcome you to community, I'm going to introduce you to uh, people you can work with, which introduced me to Nick, and uh, that's how the uh, idea about uh, creating uh, a video game uh, addressing sexual harassment started. And it's interesting because there's there's been scientific studies that gamifying things can help make behavioral changes, can help support people learning, um, you know, empathy and things like that. And so I'm curious though, you get the idea. You realize it feels like a hero's journey, and then you go to Nick. So, Nick, how do you how do you think about turning that into a game or gamifying it? What do you base it off of? What are you kind of encompassing this in to make it something that people can play? Yeah, so I, I think the you know like like when you and I need a lot of people game developers in the room. Uh -huh. Right. Um, so if you if you do this kind of stuff like game for impact work, um, everything you do is born from the subject matter first, right? Because it's that's the, that it's the hard part of it, it's the essential part of it. And especially a topic like this, which as Daniela suggested and can talk a lot more about, um, there are a lot of wrong tactics in this process that are, are assumptions that are in culture. And some of those are highly destructive parts of the ecosystem of rape culture. And some of them are just mistakes that people make and how they are empathetic and not understanding what a healing process is. 
So it was really critical that 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 be the first step, right? Like kind of understanding that. And so that the, the, the process really started with like a long, like like a like three days of us just sort of like meeting and talking about the subject matter, having nothing to do with gameplay at all. Just like, you know, what is what is the issue? How should the issue be handled? Like what are what are correct paths, incorrect paths, what are common incorrect paths? And most importantly, because it's a kind of key part of the project, who is the demographic we're trying to reach? Yeah, um, yeah we were, we were um, uh, talking a lot about like what, where to position the player and how to position the player. And the first thing that I remember uh, sharing with uh, Nick is that kind of the, the biggest problem with, with such a widespread issue of, of uh, sexual harassment and violence, that there's no... Um, uh, effective prevention thus far is that it's so uncomfortable to talk about it. And no, people don't know how to talk about it, don't, they don't want to talk about it, they don't want to engage in it, they want to think about it. Um, and I was just thinking about how about if, can we make it this kind of a safe and confidential space where you can unlearn all of this, like, oh, can you, can you kind of experience, you know, your prejudices and, and uh, not being uh, judged by it or punished by it, but, but rather kind of learn a uh, more compassionate way, uh, but, but no kind of like, you don't have to confide in anybody, you don't have to tell anybody like how much you don't know about and how, how kind of pre prejudiced you are towards, towards the experience that survivors have. And, what, and what's cool, like from, you know, start trying to apply it to games is that there are already mechanics that exist for that purpose, right? Because lots and lots of games uh, have systems in which you exist with a group of people who have trust or um, uh, uh, friendship relationships to you and then you have to have conversations with them to work them out and then you have variables that change based on decisions you make. So there was this model that sort of was there, um, but then that, and so, so that seemed pretty, like a pretty natural fit, right? And it would be, what's nice about those things is that when you look at the progression of them over time narratively, they become more and more sophisticated with like Dragon's Edge kind of being like the, I think like a good threshold for this, right? Where like they went from being very simplistic to actually quite like complex emotional relationships. And so there's, a, there's an appetite in gamer communities to explore those relationships and to just bringing it into a different space. But that like really lacked kind of two questions like the first one was okay well this has to be grounded in in some techniques whereby the actual conversation can be a measure that you're learning this material right yeah. um like the, the, you know that we're, we're not just basing the conversations on 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 I, like ideas of narrative but they're, they're grounded in things like questions about empathy and compassion and then the second one and this will pull us back to the audience again is that games don't typically only feature those mechanics though, right? That when you look at games that have trust mechanics in them, particularly games aimed, like aimed at the audiences that play things like Dragon Age, the, the dialogue mechanics exist in the framework of a larger mechanic that, that it alternates between. And I, I don't want to, I don't want to, I want you to I don't know talk. anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> but like, like when we were talking about like who the audience we wanted to reach was, it was like, oh, that audience is not gonna play. Yes, like we were we were also just discussing that kind of the the, the folks and, and the populations that need to uh, know about this the most and care about this the most would never play a game with this uh, subject matter. So we went on and uh, talk about how can we have a stealth approach to the subject matter and how can we build a world uh, in a game that players want to play regardless of the subject matter. Uh, so, so it kind of becomes more appealing and more engaging for them to um, to grasp in it. So then, how did you get to how did you get to play out? How did you get to your main character? How did you get to those mechanics and ideas that that will sort of stealthily teach people, but will bring people in who are like I believe you were saying to me earlier, like they're gamers. That that's their thing. You want them to be here playing this game. So what? How did you get to the idea of like? What inspired you for what this story ultimately is? And if you could tell people what the game's story ultimately is, or at least the core part of it. Yeah. Um, uh, so, um, okay, so we're talking about like, uh, like, uh, like, 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 like what we would think of as a kind of a hardcore gamer population. Yeah. Right? Um, and that's like probably the demographic that, yeah, I mean, we're hazarding, but probably the demographic that thinks the least about 
issues like this yeah, in a lot of cases. Yeah, it could, could need the most uh, education. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, 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 okay. So, what, what if we were taking a self close, what are they going to apply? Well, something, something that's like, like tapping into the ideas of gameplay they're used to already, right? Like, what, what are they comfortable with? What are they looking for? And you know, my standard approach to thinking about games for impact like this is to be innovative in the game design. Um, and I want to, I, I, I always say this when we're talking about this project in these contexts because I think it's kind of important. It would not have been hard to find a game very game that we could have just like pushed into the gaps of the, the dialogue. But then we're competing commercially against all of those games, and then we've got to be really, really good to get attention. Um, and that's a hard thing to do, right? Like you're competing against projects that, that have very large budgets. But if you innovate the mechanic, right, then suddenly people might just play the game because the mechanic sounds interesting, and that puts you in a different space. So the idea was to think then very hard about, well, what What's the nexus of games that we could look at that fit that market, that makes some sense with our narrative where we can innovate? And we, and we wanted to put the player in a support role, I guess. That's the, the, the most important thing that kind of myself as an advocate want to, to share about kind of how to address prevention of uh, sexual violence is to uh, kind of educate people to be active by standards, now, how to do it in a game. Right, and so that, and so that when, when we hit that point, in the summit, that was like that was an unlocking point in the game set because, okay, how do you play a role in a game where you're not the hero, right? Because you're not supposed to be the hero, you're supposed to be the support. And I thought, oh wait, there are whole categories of games where there's support roles. Like they're just, that, that's the whole thing you do. And so I went back to my team and we just started talking about MOBAs because we were like, oh, like if you play a MOBA, there's a role you play where you're not the carry, right? Like you just exist to support, it, right? Um, and so like if you think about a game like League of Legends or a game like, like Dota, um, you know, like you, you'll have these like small, you'll have these teams and they sort of cluster around each other in these like tiny little ecosystems, right? So you have a character, this is in case you're unfamiliar with these games, you have a character that's like kind of marching into the enemy armies and like doing the direct damage, but typically that character is paired with another character whose whole role is just to like change the conditions of the battle, heal this person, like, like in, interject uh, different kinds of like long-term changes to the map that then make that better. And there are people in those games who play that role exclusively. Right, like, 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 there, like, I don't know how many league players there are out there, but like, there are people who just play sport. That's like what they do. So I was like, oh, we have a model. Right, we have a model for a hardcore, a hardcore game, like, like the hardest hardcore game, where support is the the methodology. So why don't we just cut everything else out of the MOBA, and just make a game about support? Interesting. And you feel like the mechanics. That will scratch enough of an itch that someone who might not necessarily gravitate to the support role will still have that gameplay loop, that satisfying aspect of it, where they find, okay, yeah, this is this is scratching an itch. I want to do because I want to go further in this. Yeah. So we what we did internally is like there's a lot of Dota and League players like in my team, and so we just sat and like started talking about how they work, and we were like analyzing them. And I was not a League player, but I watched like I don't know. 25 hours of video on like how league works and league strategy. Um, and what I started to realize is that a lot of what you're, and I played myself very badly with people who play very well. Um, and what we, what I learned from it is that, that these are games about attention, right? They're games, they're really games where like, like, like you can't actually keep track of everything that's going on in a MOBA, like it's impossible. So what you're trying to do is optimize how well you're paying attention to things and then flip your attention between things. And this is, this is an innovative, this, this, is how, this is how I make games, right? Like, I guess it's too blunt. Like, this is a little bit off topic, but like, that's how I make games. It's like, I look at the, the emotional landscape of the game space, and I try to figure out, like, okay, what, what appeals to people about this? And I'm like, oh, this is twitchy. This is about, like, keeping track of a bunch of stuff at once. Okay, we can make other games like that. And that should work, right? Because that's why people are coming to the game in the first place. Yeah, so I guess then, ultimately, what's the core kind of game? that you have going on here that you want people to yeah. understand. All right, so this is very early prototype, as you're seeing on the screen here. Um, so this is not what it's going to look like in the long run. Like, like game developers, you know what this is, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, we, obviously this is a project that's 
leaning towards a lot of advocacy groups um, and advocacy groups that are concerned about violence, right? So making a game that's violent <laughs> was probably not a good idea. I would never be interested to make a game of a violent game. Yeah. Right. So so then it was sort of thinking like, okay, can we take those? Can we take the kind of mechanics that you see in battle and figure out something else to do? And so we just started looking at like, what are other like really intense human activities that resemble combat but are not combat? And where we where we landed very quickly was firefighting. Firefighting is dangerous. Firefighting is destructive. Firefighting involves a lot of really brave, like action um, that's 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 physical. And um, and if you think about things stuff like fire jumping, right, which maybe we all are because the air quality is in the air right now, um, right? Like like that's extremely dangerous, extremely trained work. And and also firefighters uh, have to rely on each other and have. A Great allyship, um, and uh, that this kind of plays into our trust mechanics. Exactly right. So then you have a team, and then the team, and like like as we talk about the narrative, you're going to see this come up over and over again because it became a constellation, right? You have a team. The team is a unit. The unit works with a larger organization. The larger organization has a hierarchy to it. It's often cell structured, so you're not like dealing with lots of different people. People move around. You parachute it into dangerous areas, that becomes a level, and then you deal with the consequences of the level. But you can do that without being violent. You can actually do that as being a rescuer, right? So it actually reverses the role. Like, actually what you're doing is trying to save people by fighting this thing that's not like a living thing, right? It's like, I guess, I guess backdraft claims it's a living thing. But like, uh, that was an old movie reference, everybody. <laughs> I went, wait, that's, that's how you know how old I am. Um, but like, like uh, sorry, I'm not gonna do that. Um, but like, like it, it gave us the same kind of mechanics because like suddenly we had this idea that like, oh, like a fire pile can be a unit. It can have the qualities of a unit, right? It can have stats like a unit. It can be a different type of fire pile. There can be terrain now, and the terrain can be different. Now we can, we can have towers, and towers can be things, and the team can have roles that are on these things, and then we end up sort of recreating all the same kinds of conditions that you might find in those games, but like just excising something that would have not been good for you and not been good for the marketplace. But then what's really interesting, too, is the, the kind of allegory as well of putting out fires, which is... Oh, for sure. Yes. Yeah. And, and the kind of the... Um, Entry of the game kind of asks you to find a way out from an uh, island on fire, which it turns out you're going to uh, try to find out uh, a way out from a different kind of fire. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I feel like you, when you guys hit on fire, you must have had this aha moment of like, yeah, that's, that's perfect because it has multiple meanings in this scenario. It feels the most relevant, both from like a gameplay loop perspective and from a narrative perspective for you. Hopefully, yes. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but also, you guys have um, like, actual scientific things that you're hoping to tie to this in terms of like it enacting behavioral change. Is that anything that you get to speak to at all? Yes, so uh, two, two uh, lovely people uh, are missing from our panel today um, due to overbooking or um, just kind of other obligations. Uh, one is Nandini uh, from UNESCO Mahatma Gandhi Institute of Education and Peace, and the other one is uh, Lynn from Play to Prevent, uh, uh, lab uh, from Yale. Uh, bo both of these um, uh, behavioral science labs uh, came to the project to develop a groundbreaking measurement tool so we can assess uh, through our uh, option-based narrative, we can assess uh, uh, compassion and uh, social intelligence because we want this game to be result-based. Uh, we don't want this to be just adventure and hopefully uh, uh, at the end of the game, basically, you are actually being kind of uh, gone through a, a test, behavioral science test of, of empathy and social competency that you were not, I mean, you were told to do, but there's kind of not official test uh, uh, in the game. There's no, there's no in kind of, uh, it, it's not, um, um, it, it's not stopping the gameplay or, or yeah, you your experience. Fail. Yeah, you can't fail in this, basically. If you, if you, you, you can fail, I mean, and you can stay in a loop, but uh, if you finish the game, you're automatically uh, demonstrated sufficient amount of compassion and understanding about this issue, and therefore you might be eligible for a badge, badge of trust and safety that you can uh, place on your dating app or your LinkedIn or your uh, university application, etc. Yeah, so the idea is that, um, let me see where the screen 
was. There we go. All right, so the idea is that um, like the, all this is embedded into the dialogue, right? Because like the characters, the characters will exhibit these things, and Anna as a character um, has been harassed and is dealing with the, the trauma of having been harassed. And Anna is one of your your teammates, you know. Um, she's actually a main engineer in your team of, of firefighters. Right, and so when you build enough trust with Anna, Anna starts to talk to you about these issues, and that's when we start to evaluate. Now Anna's part of your team, like, like she's not going to disappear right away. And and like by this point in the game, because again, it's it's designed to be a stealth learning exercise. You've already done this with other members of your team on things that aren't as consequential as this, right? right. So you're you're familiar with the idea that you're, you're you have to like figure out how to talk to them and build trust. But this is going to go to a different, like a very different place. And I just want to say this is an aside. This is my like my favorite thing from a learning perspective about the narrative. Um, a narrative about harassment in a hierarchical cell organization is that's actually where harassment happens in the world, right? Yeah. That's, that's the context of harassment in the world. But it's also so typical, the games of this type, that no one's even going to think about it when we put it in. Like the idea that like, oh, you work for an organization, the organization has teams, you have a boss, the boss is sort of crude, Right? Like, yeah. oh, they make jokes. It's all going to be normalized. Yeah. And then this can be revealed. Um, and then the idea is that these conversations are based on measures of empathy and compassion and critical inquiry. And the idea is that as we write them, we're, we're putting them through the measure so that the results you choose from these things have been already been mapped to certain kinds of um, uh, to certain kinds of results. And so the idea is that we don't have to survey you in and around it, right? That the gameplay itself with enough time, and I mean, this is a long process, I just want to be really clear. Like, we're going to do a quite long writing and evaluation process with UNESCO and Yale to like get this kind of alignment. Um, but if we can get that kind of alignment, it means that the play of the dialogue itself is the demonstration of learning. And then the, the how, how well you do in a dialogue, how well you actually have ability to listen and understand what your teammates uh, actually need from you, uh, you're going to feed or uh, take away from your trust meter. And your trust meter over there in a, in a upper corner uh, is going to condition your gameplay. So as in real life, if you, if you don't a really a great colleague and a teammate um, don't expect from your teammates to to um, save you in a in a fire field. Yeah, and that and that becomes complicated, right? Because in you know, like I think the the key to this kind of like social emotional learning in games is is really replicating the struggles of it in the world, right? Because it's very very I and mean, this is my another one of my standard examples. Like if you make a game about bullying and you just have like somebody pass somebody on the street bullying somebody. And there's no consequence when you say, do you stop the bully or not? Everyone stops the bully. That doesn't happen in the world because there's a consequence to doing it in the world. So the key is to think about what some of those consequences could be. And one of those consequences is if you start complaining to an organization about harassment, the people who cause the harassment will hurt you in the organization. And how can they hurt you, right? They can take away your water and your resources. Send you to more dangerous areas, right? And that so you should see those consequences in the game, right? So that, that, because like if it's meant to be something that teaches you, it needs to refer to the world so that you see the reference to the world. Yeah, and all, all of that ties into uh, assessing uh, uh, behavioral change, kind of with, without engagement and without fun and without consequences, there's kind of uh, no, no uh, significant shift. And you guys are hoping that this will launch from mobile, correct? So yes. that you can maximize the amount of people who can play this. It's really easy to dynamic. It's not going to have to be like tied to a specific console. Because this is like very youth focused, I'm mm -hmm. assuming. Yeah. Yeah. So your ideal kind of player is someone someone who plays auto chess. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. Like, like that's yeah, kind yeah, of yeah. what we're thinking about. Someone who thinks about like the the complex engine mechanics of of like, oh, these units in this board in this way. Um, will hopefully play this game. It's it it like the prototype is twitchy, right? It's very twitchy. It's very like it's like twitchy because you're like putting out fires for a while. And the idea is that this this is um, I mean I'm talking about this aesthetically. I apologize. I hate doing this with the games that you can't actually see. Um, but um, the idea is that like a fire should feel out of control, and you should feel like you're struggling to get on top of it because that's going to feed into the like the kind of adrenaline dangerous relationships that your team has, yeah. right? So we want to lean into that, but I think that's not weird. 
those kinds of games. So that